Okay. Three, two, one. Irv, just don't stand. <laughs> in. Yeah. So yeah, stand Instagram in has taken over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're ready. You're you're live. Hi, folks. Welcome. We're a little bit early. It's the first. We'll see how it affects. How many people do we have on, Frick? Uh, 107. Oh, so oh, it did. It did. Early in the day. We're, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm taking my wife out tonight. Paul Deacon, drummer of the Mavericks. If you have never heard of the Mavericks, I didn't. You should check them out. It's Cuban American music. It's really good. Anyway, they're in town, and he texted me the other day and said, "Rob, we're in town. Would you like tickets?" So I said, "Yeah." Anyway, it's a two-hour drive away, so that's why we're on a little bit early. And then this is the. Uh, this is the eve of our 23rd class. We have two students who showed up early. They didn't want to be late. One is actually a, uh, a veteran, although they didn't come as our scholarship vets. One from, you guys want to introduce yourself? Uh, wait. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa. Oh, yeah. Quit making Irvin the focus. <laughs> Are we? Guys, you don't know where to go. Jake's, Jake's the, Jake is the uh, main camera. Jake is the YouTube camera. Anyway, we, we're going to come to that as soon as he gets the camera ready. But what's our topic tonight? Is table saws? Yeah. I thought it was, uh, I read the bottom of the email. I thought it was going to be, what was the other half? Uh, cabinet doors. Cabinet doors. It's definitely table saws. Table saws. You, hey, do you have questions ready? Yep. Okay. Tim in Santa Maria, California. Hi, Tim. What are the scenarios you would move the fence to the left side of the blade? Is there any benefit to a left-handed person to do this? Well, I don't think, well, I suppose. I don't know of any saw that's built that way with that intent. Um, when do I move it to the left? The nice thing about the saw <coughs> stop is the blade tilts away from the fence. You're going to have to mount that. We're going to have to carry that. <sighs> oh, right, Jake's, Jake's a little bit... Uh, disabled. What? Disabled. Dis disabled. Jake has a broken foot, so he's walking around with a club. First of all, inter introduce our guests, or let them introduce themselves and where they're from. I am Craig Porter from Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. And tell them about your service. I was a surface floor for officer in the Navy. For how many years? Six years. Retired? Not retired from the Navy, no. Did six years and was done and then became a lawyer. Okay. I'm Bradley Smith from uh, Houston, Texas. I'm, I was a lawyer too and a judge. Two lawyers. What are we going to do? <laughs> Be careful what we say. Dangerous. Who's this? This is Chris. You know, introduce yourself, Chris. Tell them who you are. Yeah, tell them what you do for us. Chris, I'm uh, uh, somebody's got to move closer. Why? Well, oh, they don't. Mic oh, yeah, they didn't have a microphone. Chris Davenport from uh, Fredericton. I work for RPC, and I help uh, Rob and uh, Jake. Rob and Jake and spend our money. And everybody here to develop new products and make more and. Better. Can he say what he's working on right now? No. Why? Did he, he helped out with the... He's, uh, he signed an NDA. <laughs> not done to do it? <laughs> that doesn't work. Anyway, I, so go back over here to the fence. Sorry, we'll get straightened out here. This is some Vera wood. Who took the top off of this, the weight off of this? Just, just 10 minutes ago. This is for the lining of Super Day's box. So this is Vera wood. And it's yellow when you cut into it, and it goes green really quickly. Amazing. In fact, there, look. That's, that's the surface that I cut. What day did we do that? Monday? Yeah. Monday of this week. So that was sitting, so I couldn't see it. So you see the difference? It goes green really, really quickly, an emerald green. That's going to line the inside of his, his urn. So his ashes will remain in Vera Wood, which is where exactly where he would want it. To be. Um, back to the fence, third time. So this blade tilts away from the fence. My <coughs> older saw, my unisaw, tilts into the fence. So 
I like it tilting away from the fence. Uh, I'll give you an example why. So if you were cutting, if you were doing something that had um, miters on both sides, you'd cut your first miter, and then when you go to turn it around to cut the next one, you've got the, the point of the miter, and it would go underneath your fence. So what I used to have to do is I would put an auxiliary table on here, so I'd get it all set up. I'd put a quarter-inch piece of plywood on there so that the point of the miter would touch up here somewhere. So the nice thing about this is you make your first cut. You make your first miter cut, leaves a point here, spin it around, your point is up here, higher in the, and accurately against the fence, so it's a lot better. When did I ever, oh yes. So if you're going to cut a spline, so if you're going to miter something and then you're just gonna have a single spline, let me draw it for you. If I cut a miter on this, like so, and then I want to cut a single spline into that miter, um, with it tipped away, you can't really do it. But if you have it so that it's tipped in, tipped in, then you can cut. Um. Yeah, oh, that's right too. I would turn it. Shoot, Jake. Where am I Move going the fence with this? Over. I'm trying to think. So if I wanted to cut, no, that that's right too. That no, that, I just told you wrong. That would actually work this way because your your fence is out like that, and then you would have it so that your fence is moved over and you'd be able to cut it. So when would I want to have the fence on the other side of the blade? I don't do it very often. That's the reason why I'm stumbling to try to come up with a reason why. I know I do occasionally, and I, I, I'm drawing a blank, so I can't think of when I would actually when I actually do it. But I know there's something, and it'll it'll dawn on me here in the next hour, hopefully, and I'll come back to it. If I was a left-handed person, it would certainly be a lot easier. I mean, you use your dominant hand to push everything through. You always have the piece that you're keeping between the fence and the blade. So I've got my right hand on there. I would, if I was left-handed, I would certainly want to be doing it that way. But I don't know of anybody <coughs> that makes a saw. I mean, you've got a little bit of capacity with this one. You can move it over that you've got about 12 inches of room there. But certainly you don't have what the right-handed person enjoys, which is 52 inches to the right of the blade. So I'm surprised that they, somebody hasn't come up with that. Maybe they will eventually. I'll come back to that, flipping it over to the other side as soon as I can think of it. Next, Frick. Oh, wait, let me just tell them why we do this. If you're tuning in for the first time, this is, this is um, how we raise funds for our Purple Heart Project. We are about to start, as I mentioned, the 23rd class. And it will, the, the guys will all start arriving tomorrow. We start tomorrow night with a meet and greet barbecue that yours truly Frick puts on. And then class starts 7.30 Monday morning. And we'll have them here sun, uh, Monday right through till Saturday night. And this class, we have a couple of firsts. We have a uh, combat wounded husband and wife. I think my wife feels combat wounded. Uh, but that's not where theirs came from. Yeah. And do we have the, uh, we have the Aussie coming this time too? Yeah. So we've which, got... Our which isn't a first. A wounded Aussie coming, but no, because we had Ash. So it's our second Australian soldier, which they call Diggers. He's coming. But we lost two right at the last minute, so we only actually, instead of having seven wounded vets, this time we've only got five. Anyway, so you're welcome to donate. We are registered 501c3 as of December, so when they put the link on there, you can actually get a tax receipt for it. And, oh, we, we need to, uh, we haven't done one since Dave, right? No. No, we haven't. So... Terrible sad news, but uh, the guys that, Jake and I have two uh, people that work with us in this. This is uh, Colonel, retired Colonel Luther Sheely, and this is Super Dave Benson. And uh, a week ago, two weeks ago, Tuesday, two weeks ago this Tuesday, Dave's mom called me and they found him on the floor. He died of an aortic aneurysm. 
41 years old. So we will do something special in a, this is a little bit confusing tonight. We were away all week in, in uh, Columbus, Ohio at a vendor show. We just got back last night and we got the class starting tomorrow so we haven't had our thoughts together but we're going to do something significant. In memory of Dave, and we'll get those people out there, a lot of people knew him, so we'll have some stories to tell. Anyway, let's go back to questions. Frick, please. Uh, this one comes from Rob Nichols in Hanover, Pennsylvania. Hey, Rob. He says, what is a good starter cabinet table saw and things to inspect on a table saw when buying used? Um... Well, I really can't recommend anything other than a saw stop anymore. It, there's just too many advantages. And they're not all just the safety, but when you consider that the table saw is the tool that creates the, major, the majority of woodworking related injuries that require a trip to the, operate, uh, to the emergency room, then you can't justify not buying a saw stop. And I they think they have four models now. They've got, this is, this is, mine is the, what's called the industrial. And then they have one step down from that. It's called the professional. They're hard to tell apart. And then they have, I think they have at least two contractor varieties. So if you can't spring for the professional or the industrial, get one of those two. Anything else is a, uh, has to be stated as a dangerous option. Now, if I was buying a used table saw, what would I look for? See you, Brad. Um, well, that's a, I haven't been asked that question in a while, so let me think about it. I would want, I think probably most important would be the fence. You guys chime in if you, if you have something to say. Be my guest. If you have a lousy fence, you have a lousy saw. And this is, uh, this, this is actually the original Beesmeyer saw. Fence? Fence, sorry. And what was so great about it is, instead of locking front and back, it locks here, and it's sufficiently robust that it does not move out there. So it's easy to adjust. You can tilt it this way and that way to get it square to the table. You can obviously tilt it this way to get it positioned whatever way you want in terms of parallel to the blade. It's just a fantastic, it's a heavy duty, robust, the best table saw fence that's ever been made. So. If, you don't, if it doesn't have a good fence, I wouldn't even consider it because you're going to spend, if you're buying used, you're going to spend probably what you spent on the saw to buy um, a decent fence like that. So assuming it has a good fence, it's got to be, I think it's got to be heavy enough that uh, it's not going to tip over. And I, I say that if you're trying to cut a sheet of plywood and you're resting half of your blade on the, or half of the plywood is on the table. You don't want to be tipping over. So the heavier it is, the better it's going to be. It's going to be more stable. It absorbs vibration. Of course, you want a nice big top. The bigger the top, the better. It's just there's nothing like having great support when you're trying to cut something. So I'd want a big top. I'd want it to be flat. Check it. I had a, an old beaver cast iron table saw that belonged to my father. And there was a problem. I don't remember what the problem was, but when I finally found out why, I put a straight edge across the fence, and it probably had an eighth of an inch dip in there. So you want your table to be as close to being absolutely flat as possible. Horsepower. Well, let me, let me show you this. I don't know if Jake can get down in here or not. But one of the... No, I can't. You can't get down there? Not in my well, current state, no. So the, one of the uh, best, big advantages of this is that it uses a serpentine belt, if you see that. So it's a thin belt like you find on your car that's got multiple ribs. And the ribs add, um, uh, not traction, what's the word I'm looking Grip. for? Grip. You don't want the saw slipping. So on the older saws, you'd have three short belts and it took a lot just to turn them, but they had to do that in order to get extra grip. Well, these guys do it with a serpentine belt, which is a really smart thing. So I would want to make sure that you have uh, a really good connection between the saw, the, the arbor, and the motor. Uh, I've never seen a direct drive worth it anything. I think your, I think your adjustments here, 
you can tell you've got elevation and you've got angle. And if they don't feel good and solid, then there's something wrong. I'd buy, I'd pass on that. I'd be really fussy if I was going out and buying a used saw. And I have no, I have nothing. I buy mostly used equipment, but good equipment, new or used, is fantastic. Garbage equipment, new is terrible, used is even worse. So stick with the brands. You know, if it's old Powermatic, if it's old Rock, Delta Rockwell, if it's old General, if it's old, um, some of the other older brands, Oliver. Some of the older brands that were just built to last, I wouldn't have a problem buying them, except for the fact they don't have the safety feature. What are you going to try to do, push that around? No, I'm just sitting down. Okay, next, Rick. Next one is uh, from Dan Patton in Fall River, Nova Scotia. Hey, Dan. Oh, local. Do you have a favorite brand of table saw blades? Yeah, I do. I do. So if you look, where I don't know, it's in the other shop. How many saw blades would we have, Jake? 50? 41. 41. We have at least 50 saw blades. We have Simons. Is it Simons or Simmons? Yeah, Can't remember what which. Is it? We have Freud. We have uh, Forrest. <clears throat> we have, oh, I'll bet you there's five, six, maybe seven different brands. Freud is the best. The, it's the least expensive. Now, how often does that ever happen? I shouldn't say the least expensive. Of all the major brands, it's probably the least expensive. And it cuts as well as any of them do. I bought a Forest one time because I heard all the hype about it. And uh, I think after it dulled, we never bothered even getting sharpened again. It was so unimpressed. So I really like all I use now, all we buy are Freud. And I have two saws that I keep here so i have my own table saw the guys over in the other shop have a couple of theirs over there so i used to i don't use combination blades anymore i use rip and a designated cross cut so if i'm cutting something and i want a really fine cut in plywood or yeah softwood softwood yeah i'll use here it is right here is it 80 tooth there's an 80 tooth cross cut and I'll change that out. Otherwise, I use a rip. I think that's 24 tooth. That's a heavy duty. Oh, that's the full, full, full width. What's this? How many teeth? 24. 24 tooth rip. And that's all you need. And I, and I, I run all, the, all of mine now. I run the thin kerf, which is 3 30 seconds of an inch as opposed to an eighth of an inch. You're cutting, you're moving less material, less waste. And we just ripped... The other day, we made some veneer. We made some veneer for Dave's box. That's where, where's the box, Jake? Where did I put it? Oh, it's right down the bandsaw. Right, you, I should show them that. Let me just get it. Hey, if I sing, does it get picked up on the... Yeah, yes. all too well. <laughs> what are you telling me? So this is... This is uh, Super Dave's. I, I know I didn't use all these tools, so I don't know why they're on my bench, but we'll leave that to the... Uh, who. So the box is made out of really nicely figured fiddleback maple. The dovetails were left proud. Hang on. I want to come over and Jake see. Jake will come over and have a peek. It's going to have a wood hinge because his wife, Michelle, wants to be able to put stuff other, other stuff in there. So the lid, in order to keep a, make a stable lid, it's a piece of quarter-inch MDF banded with maple all the way around, that same maple, and then sandwiched between two pieces of homemade veneer, shop-made veneer, which was... I wanted to show that to you. So that, Oh, here it is right here. Excuse me. We lost, uh, oh, we what lost, you, what lost you the video. Come on. I guess they can still hear you. Jake's working on it. So there's a nice piece of fiddleback maple. And I was using the thin kerf rip blade. 
and I was able to make a full height, so it's a three inch cut. You're wireless. I'll just keep talking, or we're gonna wait. There you go, yeah, you're we're back. back. Yeah. So I'm, here's a piece of maple, and I, I, ran, I actually ran it this way. So I cut, what did we cut, 330 seconds? I think, no, less than that, because we wanted, we wanted to finish up with just a 16th. So six, two, 330 seconds, that's right. 330 seconds of an inch thick, and I was able to make two cuts. So I went over the table saw like this, flipped it over, and went over like that, and then went over in the bandsaw and finished it. And there was no run out on the table saw. So to be cut full width going through a piece of maple and not suffer run out means, means that the blade is good and the table saw is good. And then we did the same thing with a piece of vera wood. We cut, we made making vera wood, thin strips of vera wood in order to line the inside. So this proves that uh, those blades are as good as any. So Freud blades, thir uh, 60, 80 tooth, 80 tooth cross cut and 24 tooth rip. That's my recommendation on a 10 inch saw. Next. Uh, next one comes from Doug Berger in Bremerton, Washington. Doug Berger. Doug Berger? Berger. Berger. He was in our class. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Doug. He says, what is your suggestion for miter sled and how best to use it? Okay, back up. Well, you, you, guys are, you guys are talking things I really like talking about. And Luther's going to say, I told you to do that. What I'm referring to is my sled. So I prefer the uh, shop-made ones. This is the one that uh, I used Wait, to use. What? He said miter. He said miter? Read that again, Frick, please. Uh, what is your suggestion for miter sled and how best to use it? I was all wow, I saved, excited about that. I saved them from a giant rant unrelated to the question. That was supposed to be funny. Same idea. So I build this the same way that I would build the crosscut sled. Um, make sure that when you do your ways, that there's absolutely no slop in them. And then you start off with a piece of MDF that is squared up and you've got to check your diagonals. It should be right on. And then I just come in there with my fence and I put a strip of glue on the two rails, leaving them higher. E either leave them higher or prop them up so they stick up above the table. And put a strip of glue down the middle of them, set your MDF down on top of it, tight against the fence so you know it's square. And then weight this down. Once the glue's dried, come in and put screws in and, uh, and then run your cut through. And Bob's your uncle. Works great. Now, I made, what I was going to say that applies to this as well, is my main crosscut sled was this monster, which was really nice because it had the capacity. It's 19. Uh, no, it's more than that. I don't uh, have my tape. I had it, and I took it out of my pocket. I saw Irvin walking around with it. <laughs> well, then I'll never find it. Anyway, it had tremendous capacity, but it was a heavy thing and lifting that up and down all the time. So we finally went in and we made this little one, which I probably use. Where's that blade? I probably use uh, 10 times for every one time I use the big one anymore. And I would, I would uh, do the same thing with your cross cut. Make a small version like this that's just easy to manipulate. How often do you need that full capacity? Very rarely. Show them your flat miter one. Huh? Show them the one you use. Oh, that one too? Miter. I gotta put some of these back. So what Jake is referring to is if you're wanting to cut, say a picture frame, 
and it had flat, just a flat picture frame. Where is it, Jake? Oh, you know what? It might be next door. Huh? It's in, it's in the other door. shop. Well, a lot of good that was. You didn't save them well, on that one. at least one. you put it away. Sorry, it's in the other shop. And it's a really good idea, too, so I'll get somebody to go over and Chris, get it that knows. I'll go over and see if you can find it. It's, it's V-shaped. It's designed, it's designed so that when you, when you cut, your two pieces are at a 90 degree. It should and be it would be it would be over on the yeah, but it would probably be if you're standing there using this saw stop, the big one, the main one, it would probably be over towards your left. It might possibly be underneath. It could be hanging up. We'll see you. It shows over in an hour. Try to make it back. I used to love it when my father would tell me to go fetch a certain tool. It's like I know I'm going to get in the wrong thing. Or I'm not going to be able to find it. He's going to yell. Poor Chris. Next. Uh, Jerry Weeks in Comfort, Texas. Hey, Jerry. Comfort, Texas. That sounds comfortable. comfortable. Is there a good aftermarket riving knife you can recommend? The one that came with my jet table saw is more dangerous than it is. Riving oh, knife. Riving knife, yeah. Is there a good aftermarket? Yeah, that you recommend. Who, where did you get ours? You bought it from Saw Stop. Yeah, they right. No. Sorry. Sorry, I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't. And I don't know if there's another saw popular. I, I can't imagine anybody today making aftermarket parts for a table saw that wasn't a saw stop. Now I'm gonna. I'm gonna qualify what I just said, so you won't think I'm, I'm a table saw snob. I was just came back from the vendor show. It's a. It's a woodcraft vendor trade show. So it's two days long. The only people that it, it's closed. It's private. So the only people that are there are the store owners that own any one of the 80 some odd woodcraft stores and the corporate people and all of those of us who manufacture or sell products to them. We should give them a round of applause. That's pretty good, Chris. Now, what if we just send Frick over for that? What he would have come, ba come back with a chisel. <laughs> yeah, and, a, and blood. I don't touch chisels. All right, let me come back to this in just a second. I want to finish what I'm telling you. So, uh, I know most of the store owners, I think I know them all, and Woodcraft would represent, the, Woodcraft is the largest uh, retailer of woodworking tools in the world. Uh, there's, nobody has that many stores, that big of an, an impact. And uh, so, you can look at what they sell and pretty much say, well, that's what's going on in the world of woodworking. So I asked Michelle, who has the store in Seattle, which I think is their number one store in the franchise. I said to her, because I used to watch this. I've been doing, I've been in their stores working since 2006. And I used to go in and if I would see a power, by the, once, would, once Saw Stop came on board and it took a few years to get some traction, but say by, the, by 2008, 2009, if I would go into a store and there'd be a Powermatic table saw or a Unisaw, in the, I'd say, I'd ask them, I said, how long has that been there? And they said, it's been a year, year and a half. They do not sell. So then I asked Michelle, I said, what's the ratio? And she goes, oh my, she goes, we don't sell. We, we only sell saw stop. Nobody comes in to buy anything else. It is a rare occurrence that somebody would come in and buy some other brand of table saw. Just So you're trying to find an aftermarket product part for some other brand of table saw, if it's, I can't imagine anybody making them. It's just, there's no, there's no business there. Mind you, there's lots of table, old table saws out in the market, but sorry, I can't help you on that one. Here, let me show you this, this flat miter. So the nice thing about this, maybe if I put these away, I wouldn't be quite so crowded. Isn't it funny? You drop your glasses and it goes right underneath your foot, just waiting to be stepped on. So this fits in here. If I had two pieces, I'd... Uh... Slice up that. What's that walnut from? That walnut is for the... Uh... It's for the... Uh... 
Oh, yeah. Got some of my long hair in my mouth. It is for... Yeah, I know. Something. I can't think. So here's how you, here's how you do a nice spider. I put the, the sandpaper on here. I'll tell you about that in a second. If you want to really, as long as you, you're making this, you make this accurately, then you just go in and you bring both pieces like so, and you run the blade through both pieces at the same time. And that should give you a really nice fit. You want it high enough. I made mine high enough so if you're cutting a crown molding that's going to be sitting like that, then you can actually have it so that it's sitting at the angle that you're gonna hang it and do the same thing, run the blade through it after you've made, after you made the initial cut, then you go in and do that finished cut. This is the sandpaper and we're going, we're, we're gonna, we, this week, Jake? Next week. Next week, you'll be able to buy it. We'll have it on our site. So this is self-adhesive sandpaper. It sticks well, and on something like this, it just gives you a great grip. Now, I decided to go in and just stack up a whole bunch of MDF in here just so that when that passes through, I mean, there's a little bit of the blade meets a little bit of resistance, but it also keeps all of this stuff together and gives it lots of support. Now, I also should explain this. I, I use quarter-inch material on here because if you don't, then you're robbing your capacity of your blade but it makes for a somewhat uh, flimsy, I shouldn't say flimsy, not as durable. Um, jig? Jig, yeah. Uh, now this, this if it, when I make them and they're in my shop, they get protected. But when they're in the main shop and everybody and their dog's using them, then they start to kind of get beat up a little bit. That's the reason why the... Should you, so should you have made that out of three eighths instead of quarter? No, no, quarter's fine. There's enough support holding that. It's just, it's essentially all it's doing is just moving the, moving the piece that you're cutting without having to slide the piece over the table. What was the last question? I drift. The riving knife? Riving knife, yeah. Next one then. Uh, can you show your table sled storage? A couple of people have been asking. Yeah. And blades. Yeah. And blade table shows... So we did this as one of the projects in the online workshop. If you haven't, if you're, if you're interested. All right, I'm going to give you a little pitch. We do have to pay the bills, you know. Um, most people that get into woodworking don't have any source of instruction. They're either watching videos on YouTube or uh, reading a book. Nobody reads books much anymore. So what we do, we started this in 2011. Uh, once the bandwidth had grown, we have an online workshop where now we broadcast three 45-minute episodes each week, and it gives you the opportunity to walk through a project. So I'm just going to take you through this room, and I'm going to tell you what's on there. Uh, one of the first projects we did was this my workbench, and that took up a total of 100 and. 80, 180 episodes. And the only thing we don't do on there is we don't, I don't, if I'm cutting four dovetailed corners, like for instance this, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna film all four corners. We'll do one, maybe even two if we do a little variation. Anyway, so this bench is on here. This tool cabinet is on here, which is still work in progress. This little cabinet right here, which I've always wanted a place to store all the stuff drill press related. Now, the only thing I'm going to do different is I'm going to go in and I'm going to divide them up. I didn't do this on all of them, but I did on this one. In other words, you just end up with a drawer full of junk. This way I have separated junk. Um, I think we did this. YouTube or online workshop? Online workshop. Oh, no, that was YouTube. Yeah. YouTube? Well, various different YouTubes. Yeah. This cabinet, this is where I store all of my, all of my uh, router bits. And you take advantage of whatever little ideas I've come up with over the years. This cabinet, which is mobile, and this is where we keep all of my power tools. This cabinet, which is where all of my clamps are. I wouldn't want to guess the value of this. And it's a mirror image, so 
What you see on this side is on the back side as well. This is all done in mahogany and bird's eye to match this. This cabinet around my, that's all right guys, you don't need to move. Around my table saw, my chop saw, and there's nice deep drawers, took advantage of the space. Two for two. And there's my, there's my uh, removable trash bin, all dovetailed. Of course you have to do that. And if we come down here, you got to have wrenches. So we built this base. Nice and organized. And yeah, nice and organized. Don't even want to see in there too quick. Um, spin around. What else have we got in here? I think that's the only, the only other thing is what you just asked about, which is this. Had to organize. This is a great space for stuff that is table saw related. I hate having it hang on the wall because then I got to take a hike to the other side of the shop. Now, you say, well, a hike? It's not that far. Well, in the last shop it was. So we organized this. We made it out of um, most all the stuff in here is made out of a combination of pine and Douglas fir. So this was pine plywood banded with Douglas fir. So this is where we store all of the various pieces that are used on the table saw. So Chris just brought this in. Thank you. So right here is where the miter gauge goes, which is a nice convenient place, easy to get at. And then the big, the big uh, sled sits in here, and then the little sled sits right in there. Nice little spot for it. Does that go the other way, Jake? And then this is where my, this is where my uh, sleeve for my fence goes. I, I try to be careful not to beat it up when I put stuff back in. Over here, what goes in there? Oh, that's the, that's the mitered one. The flat mitered one goes in here. This, oh, this is the one that we use for, if you're cutting spline. a spline in a miter, in a mitered piece, that's where that goes. And, you know, blades are sitting in here. We could have done a better job with the blades. And uh, that's the uh, cartridge for the saw stop. I didn't put this on wheels, but I didn't have the height. It doesn't need to move anyway. And it goes all the way through the other side. And it's open on the other end. Didn't need to not be open. So that's that. Anyway, how do they get on the online workshop if they want? Uh, from our website? Go to the website, go to the top bar. It says. The top bar. It doesn't say online workshop. Yeah, it does. Yes, no, it, does. it doesn't. Yes, it does. What's it say? Rob Cosman's online workshop. Well, there you go. <laughs> Follow the instructions. And when you join, you get access to all of the episodes we filmed. I think there's 3,000. If there isn't 3,000, there's very close to 3,000. There quite possibly could be more than 3,000. And there's numerous projects. We've been doing it since 2011. What's it cost? Twenty-five dollars a month. You can do twenty-five a month. If you do six months, it's a little less, ten percent less. And if you do a year, I think it's a twenty percent saving. So, next frick, please. Uh, Terry from Tacoma, Washington. Hi, Terry. What's your opinion of the saw stop overarm dust collection system? <laughs> it's terrible. Ask him. He just bought it. <laughs> It's, um, it, oh, the saw, oh, yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, the saw, the saw stop one is lousy. Well, no. What, have the they saw stop sells two. Sells two? Because they bought Excalibur. Oh, they bought Excalibur. So theirs was lousy. They bought Excalibur. Excalibur is great. <clears throat> we have one over in our other shop. In fact, I just got another one, and I was going to use it on here, but we really don't have room. So somebody's going to take it home with them. When you are cutting anything, MDF, Exotic woods, you put that on there, you, don't, you can't even smell the MDF. And, and when, we're do, when we build workbenches, so they're ripping up lots of sheets of one-inch MDF. And if they've got that on running, it's just absolutely fantastic. As long as you, there's you, material on both sides of the blade. Good point. Good point. If you're making your cut down through the middle of the board so that all of the, uh, all or any of the dust 
is coming up that one slot. In other words, staying in line with the table saw blade, it works fantastic. If you're just trimming off a little bit on the edge, but it's not very often you're going to do that. It's not as good because it's throwing it off to the side, but overall it's great. Now you do have, you need to have the capacity in your dust collector, but um, yeah, I, I would highly recommend it if you're dealing anything with nasty dust. Definitely get that. We don't we don't cut a lot of we don't cut enough in here to warrant me having to go in and reconfigure my router table and all the rest of it in order to run it in here. So that's why we're not going to do it. But in the other shop, absolutely, we have to have it. Next. Uh, next one comes from Jim in Fort Worth, Texas. Hey, Jim. Do you recommend a table saw offcut table on the back side of the table saw? And how do you DIY one? Do we? Do I recommend an offcut? Yeah, so I built one. I definitely do. Especially if you're working by yourself and you're running a, a piece of uh, eight inch plywood and you're trying to cut it and you don't have something catching it out there. I mean, that, you're just an accident waiting to happen. You're totally out of control. So we made one on the online workshop and uh, we, didn't, we didn't take it with us when we moved shops. So we bought this one. So this is, this is, is this a, uh, so this is a saw stop product. And I, I'm, I'm, it was somewhat complicated to put together, which sounds a little bit silly, but there's so many nuts and bolts and pieces and holes. But once we got it together, it, it's great. And it's easy to collapse and it'll fold right down out of the way. We never do because we have the space. But yeah, I'm, uh, I think that's fantastic. You could make one. Uh, do you remember how much that cost, Jake? I think it's 400. It's a well spent $400. Next. Oh, here, hold on just one second. So I just want to mention it, but we are going to, uh, we are going to find an appropriate place. So I, I organize pickup hockey because in Canada, that's all we do. So we play Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at noon. And uh, it's a Purple Heart venture. So I have jerseys made. That's the Purple Heart logo. Now that's supposed to be Bird's Eye Maple, but that's as close as we could get. So this is the uh, white team, and then the dark team, the same things in purple. And my daughter, Annika, had a great idea. She said, Dad, why don't you put the name? Yeah, uh, sorry. I didn't expect that. Anyway, we put the uh, name of uh, combat wounded vets that have come to our class. And I just happened to find that right after we found out. So we'll... We'll hang that one from our rafters. Oh, I get 15 more minutes. Give me a different question, Frick, please. Uh, Jim in Atlanta, Georgia. On a SawStop Pro, can you use a dado set without an eight inch triggering cartridge by turning on the bypass switch? On the, say that again, please. Uh, on a, a SawStop Pro, professional, yeah. Yeah, can you use a dado set without an 8 inch triggering cartridge by turning on the I button? doubt it. I doubt it. They, 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 uh, they made it so you can't bypass their safety stuff. So you end up, you, get, you buy uh, one of these cartridges if you haven't already seen it. It it's probably takes, oh, I don't know, maybe an extra f five minutes to get everything set up, but that's. That's the dado cartridge. 
Well, I don't think you'd want to run one without that. No. Because you're running four times, five times the amount of blade. Yeah, if you're gonna, if you're spending the money on the saw stop, don't, don't, uh, don't try to bypass what they're doing to protect you. So definitely get it. It's worth it. I don't know how much it costs. Probably another hundred dollars. It's not a cheap saw, but replacing your fingers. You guys come from the land of expensive Medicare. What's the cost to sew a finger back on? I haven't found out, but I'm sure it's expensive. I'm sure it's $20,000 or something. I know SawStop does a little promo, and uh, the guy had cut off two fingers, I think, and um, couldn't afford both. Had to decide which finger he wanted because he couldn't afford to spend the money on both to get both sewn back on, so... I if, testify they work. Yeah. Just, just barely touch the skin. That was it. Yeah, I did it too. <laughs> I did it too, and I hardly had the blade up. You could barely even see the blade. I was just, I was cutting quarter inch by quarter inch long skinny pieces to make wooden dowels for the wood hinge boxes. And uh, before you run them through, your dowel maker, you uh, knock off the corners. So I had the blade at a 45 degree angle and just enough to knock a little 45 off of there. And I held it, I moved my finger over there just enough just to touch my finger and set it off. Anyway, survived. Next, Frick. Uh, Doug Irish in Scottsdale, Arizona. Hey, Doug. Here's a question about blade height. Some say that just the tip of the blade should protrude above the surface of the piece being cut. Others say, no, it should be raised so that you can see the bottom of the gullet. What do you say? Well, I didn't know there was any such advice. Um, I don't think I would have... Well, here's the, uh, the pros and cons. If you're running... If you're ripping a, a narrow piece and you have the blade just barely clearing, there's a real tendency for that to push the piece up. I guess, I guess it's the angle of attack that you're talking about. That same piece, if you were cutting it, and you had the blade up that high, then the angle of it, the, the, the blade cutting the wood is actually pushing down like this, holding it tight to the table. So this is advantageous, the other isn't. This is dangerous, you've got all that extra blade, the other one is much safer. So find a happy medium. If I was cutting something like this, just out of habit, I would probably have the blade sitting right about there. So you'd, I, I definitely wouldn't want it just clearing, especially on sheet goods. If you're cutting plywood, it's going to have a tendency to push the plywood up. Remember, the cutting force is, is uh, instead of coming down onto it, it's almost running parallel, and it makes it uh, a lot harder to get a nice cut. So safety-wise, keep it as low as possible. Performance-wise, keep it as high as possible. How's that for an answer? Next, Prick. This one's from uh, Melanie in Minnesota. Hi, Melanie. She says, sometimes when running a piece of wood through the saw, the piece shakes, it vibrates as it goes through the blade. What's causing this, and can I stop it? Thanks. Yeah. So the most important, if you want to talk wood, wood, wood uh, table saw fundamentals, here... Well, you don't have to now, but I'm giving it to you. I just don't have any room for it. Woodworking, wood table saw fundamentals. You need to have a flat surface on the table, and you need to have a straight square edge against the fence. Doesn't matter what's on the top. Doesn't matter what's here on the edge or the ends. Well, actually, that's not true either. It's very difficult to try to push something like that through with a mitered end on it. Ideally, you've got flat, straight and flat and square in the end so that you have good contact going through. If your board, if your board is flapping, your insert might be sitting low, so now you're sawing and that is actually not actually making contact, you know, sitting on the table, but the insert's lower, so that's got room, you know, there's space underneath this piece as it passes over the insert, and now you're not getting it nice and secure and that's gonna make it vibrate. I suspect the single biggest problem is that you're running a board that does not have a flat surface on the bottom. So that would be the first thing I check. The second thing I would check is make sure that your table saw insert is flush, 
flush with your table. Don't want it sitting low. Uh, you think of anything else, Jake? You want to make sure that you're tight against there. Really, that's that's an extremely dangerous one if you're not. If it's rocking like that, you go through, and there's force from the blade pushing it back this way. Well, if it's rocking like this, it's just too easy for it to get out of control, and then it gets swings over like that, and the blade catches it and fires it off there, which is the reason why you want a splitter, but that's not going to help until your board gets to that point. And if your blade's dull... That could be a reason too. Nice sharp blade, just like planes and chisels. The sharper it is, the less effort is required to cut. The less effort required to cut means the greater control you have, whether you're running a board over a table saw or whether you're using a chisel in the bench. Next. Uh, Jerry Weeks, uh, again, I think he had another one. He's from Texas. <laughs> The height adjustment on my cabinet style table saw is taking more effort than usual to raise. I noticed probably a lubrication issue. I've oh, wish cleaned here. the trunnion and gearing. What do you recommend for lubrication? Wow. We, our, our saw stop over there was you could hardly turn it. And the uh, nice thing about having good people working for you, I said, Ken, can you fix that? And whatever he did, he took it all apart. And we had when he's done with it, it worked wonderfully. If you lubricate in there, the problem is you've got wet, sticky lubricant in an extremely dusty environment, which means it's just going to gather dust and gunk, and then it gets hard and crusty and problem starts all over again. So what do we do on ours? I don't know, but you could use that dry graphite stuff. Yeah. Or just keep it clean. I mean, you have to put something on there. Um, I would probably use that... Uh, Bow shield, because that goes on and dries. That dry, that goes on and dries and is not sticky, so it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't gather and hold dust. And I don't work, you know you can buy it. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know what that is. Oh, so it's called bow shield. B o s h i e l d it was developed by Boeing, and it is a uh, it's in an aerosol can. It is uh, it actually goes into the metal. It lubricates and protects. It's expensive, comes in an aerosol can, as I mentioned, and it's great stuff, but whatever it costs, it's worth, because it's, it's, uh, it just does the job that nothing else does as well. Bow shield. We should probably look into getting that. So on the cleaning, I had the same problem with mine. You go in the back inspection port and take a, one of those little wire brushes and you clean all, you know, the whole gear there, you clean it all out. And the store that I bought mine from had me put um, lithium grease on it, white. But it, it does pick it up, so I have to clean it every couple months. So what he's saying, lithium grease, and you could use WD-40, you could use a lot of things. But this bow shield, when it dries, you can actually use it on your tabletop, too, to lubricate your tabletop. When it dries, it's no longer a magnet for dust. So I think bow shield is the best answer to that solution, that problem. Best solution to that problem is what I meant to say. Next, Rick. Uh, That's the last question we have, actually. Arrest in, O-Rest in Hamilton. O-Rest? Yeah, O-R-E-S-T. That's all I have. Um, he's interested in seeing you troubleshoot uh, things on the table saw. For example, what do you do if the blade isn't square to the fence? How do you adjust the blade? Okay. Let me, go through, let me go through and answer that. I just, want to, uh, I just want to mention a couple of things before. We, well, that's on my mind. So the second half of our episode tonight is going to be on Thursday at... Eight. Eight Eastern? No. Seven Eastern. Seven Eastern. And that's going to be when the guys are here in the class. Actually, there's a lady in the class too, remember? So we'll go through and talk to them, and we'll give you a feel for what it's like to actually be in the class. So you want to join us for that. Um, we'll also give away our prizes. So for every $1,000 that gets donated, we buy a finished product from three different combat-wounded vets, two combat-wounded vets. One is the wife of a combat-wounded vet, and they deserve Purple Hearts too. And uh, they usually are about a $300 retail value. That's what we pay from them. And we give away one, we draw prize, we draw names and give away one for every $1,000. So whatever, whatever was donated tonight, we'll add to what was donated Thursday night, and we'll take care of that part of it. 
And I think that's it. So let me talk about this. So the question was the uh, troubleshooting on the table saw and the, what was this? Well, what, what if the blade is not right? Okay. So one of the things that sold me, this is just going to sound like a saw stop commercial. First of all, you have to understand my background. I, I started life as a woodworker using a shopsmith. The most dangerous table saw apparatus in, I have ever seen. Oh my goodness. I'm surprised that I made it through my teenage years with, all, with my limbs, never mind my fingers. And then I moved to a, uh, I had a little beaver. My father had a beaver table saw. And it was a small job site saw that was easy to carry around. And it had a little, one, a little uh, three quarter horsepower motor and it was, uh, it was a poor excuse for a table saw, but I made it work. Um, I think the next one that I owned, I bought an old 19, early 1940s, I think it was, um, Unisaw. Thought it died and went to heaven. At university, I worked on an all big Oliver. I worked on big Power Maddox. I worked on big Deltas, 12 inch. I worked on more Unisaws. So I've had a pretty good experience with a pretty good uh, amount of experience on multiple different table saws. When I bought the saw stop, the day we the day it arrived, we I had bought it off the show floor. I was doing the wood show circuit from coast to coast, and the last four shows, saw stop was doing the same show, and they were usually set up within I don't know fifty feet or so. And uh, I kept hearing that thing go off. I'd be demonstrating, and bang, they'd set this off with a hot dog, scare the crap out of me. Anyway, I kept trying to talk myself out of buying one. And then I thought, if one of my kids ever got cut on the table saw because I didn't spend the money to buy this, I'd feel terrible. So I bought it, got it shipped home. So it came from Victoria, BC, which is on the west coast of Canada, all the way to the east coast. When it arrived, Bo, uh, Jake, and Rex were just young kids. And it came, we picked it up on a steel trailer we had. It was on a skid, and it, uh, it had, a, it had a, uh, a box kind of around it. I had just assumed that it was fastened to the pallet, and it weighs 600 pounds. So we were going to slide it to the edge of the trailer and then just slowly lower the, get the balance, so we'd lower the pallet down, and then we could slide it off. It was me and two little kids. Anyway, as we started to tip it, all of a sudden, the table saw went right over it because it wasn't secured to the pallet, landed on the concrete floor on the edge and flipped. So it was upside down sitting on the concrete floor. Anyway, the next day I went in to deal with it, took it all apart, figured there was damage somewhere. And that's when I found out how well these things were built. The only thing wrong with it was when it hit the table, when it hit the floor, it put a little bit of a burr on the top side. There was no damage at all. So... If you take this apart, on good saws, you've got a nice big heavy trunnion. That's that big massive cast iron stuff that the blade is attached to through an arbor and the power transmission comes through your motor. Well, this is attached to the cabinet. The tabletop is sitting and attached to the cabinet. So you can, the, because this is independent, you have to make sure that the, you have to get the blade so it's parallel to these tracks where your miter gauge these miter gauge slots on on good saws there's four bolts one in each corner and you would loosen all four bolts and then usually you would use you would use a uh, some kind of a device well I was going to pick it up because it usually is sitting there I'll use the small version I would use a sliding T bevel and I would reference can't reach I don't think maybe I can I would reference off of the slot I can't and I would I would reference that tooth I'd have the blade up all the way and then I would follow that tooth over to the other side and it should line up and you would work it until they both uh, both the same tooth on both sides was touching exactly the way it should so you knew it was parallel and then you would tighten it up when I went to do that on this one or to check it I found out how well they made it. So they have four bolts, one in each corner. And then they have a pin right here. So there's a center pin that ties the cabinet to the top. There are two set screws mounted on the outside of the cabinet here and here. So what you do, 
once you've loosened the four bolts, is you simply tighten this set screw, back this one off, and you're, what you're doing is, from this pivot point, you're moving the whole table in this fashion. And you simply dial it in until you get it perfectly square. And then these are locked tight. You simply tighten the four bolts, and there you go. It's done perfectly. To try to do that without that is a real pain because everything moves when you try to do it. I would usually snug them up a little bit and then use a rubber mallet to try to tap it and hopefully eventually get it in where it belongs. But you... Uh, I, I didn't mention I didn't mention that the way I should have. But the easiest way to do it is to take your larger um, combination square and bring your blade up all the way. Give me two seconds. Let me go find uh, let me go find the long the bigger combination square. It's over in that tool cabinet. Oh no it's not. Did you have it, Jake? No. Well, it's not out there. So, I use our imagination. Move the blade over. I would mark this. I, I would get my Sharpie out. I had one here. There. And I'd mark one tooth, so you knew for sure which one you're working with. Blade all the way up, and I would move my gauge over until this, I could just, your teeth stick out beyond this saw plate. This is the plate, this is the carbide tooth. The carbide tooth is bigger or wider than the plate is thick, so that there's clearance on both sides. So I would move this over until when I did this, I would just touch, you could just feel it touching the end of the blade. And then I would move that all the way over to this side, and I would come in, and I would do the same thing over here, and you had to get it so that it touched the same amount back there as it did in the front. And there's a little bit of frigging around in order to get that, but once you get it, you lock it down, and you're good to go. So that is the easiest way to set up your table saw top to your table saw base, on the assumption that you have a good saw where the trunnion, the part that holds the blade, is actually attached to the base. Some of the cheaper models, it's bolted to the underside of the tabletop, and I've never had one like that, so I can't even tell you how to do it, but hopefully it's not too difficult. Okay, oh yeah, we are over time. So we will s thank you, is Luther on? Yeah. Hey Luther, thank you to Luther. Uh, doing all the organizing. He's not going to be here this week, but he's done all the background organizing to get this class pulled together, and he had double duty because this was normally going to be Dave's class. He would have taken care of all this, and he would have been here. So you can imagine we had to go in and get Super Dave's... We went down to pick up Super Dave's computer. How did you get into his computer? Did his wife know his password? She guessed it. She guessed it? <laughs> well, that doesn't surprise me. What did John Podesta, his was a uh, password. So we got that, and then, it, Dave, and then so Luther had to step in and take over where Dave left off and uh, get everybody here and all, all the loose ends tied up. So our class will work smoothly this week. And uh, Ken on? No, oh, Ken's away. Who else am I forgetting to thank? Oh, we didn't have Angie. Angie and Lynn... Howdy, howdy. We'll see you guys. We'll talk to everybody on Thursday night. These guys are trying to get out of here. Oh, just I need, I need to mention this. So we did our first PHP barbecue in how many years, Frick? Uh, two, over two. Over two years. Yep. And we set a record today on the amount, uh, over $1,000. Yep, uh, uh, $1,058. $1,058. In two, in two hours, which is... Way above what we've ever done before. Right. Usually we're there three and a half hours. They were lined up three deep for a mile, wanting to get a hold of one of these smash burgers. Oh, and I forgot Irvin's here, Frick's friend. He's been doing the camera for Instagram, Instagram and worked out there. So a whole bunch of them are working all day. So they've been at it all day and they're tired. So that's why they're flagging me down. So we will see you guys in a couple of days. Thank you for being here. Appreciate your support. Remember, if you know any combat wounded vets... 
turn them on to our website so they can go in there and apply for our program. And quite possibly, we only have about, we accept one for every three that applies, so it's not like we're turning away a whole bunch of people. Okay, appreciate your support. We will see you in a few days.